Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I hope I hope I can take you to a nice uh, into a nice tour uh, today for this talk around uh, scanning the internet and kind of doing like large scale, wide scale, internet wide uh, projects, research, and collecting data. And hopefully, we can engage in some uh, some discussions and and see like what your thoughts on this are and maybe. Uh, discuss this, you know, in, in, in lots of different ways, and maybe you have ideas that we didn't have. And uh, yeah, it, I, I hope it will be challenging, and maybe some of you uh, can take away, I don't know, the next research project from this. So quickly, um, I mean, this is Internet uh, Scan All the Things, the presentation. It's about a project that we're doing uh, as Rapid7 officially, which is called Project Sonar. I'm going to go into that later on, but it's um, yeah, it's the whole the whole theme is um, doing internet scanning and not only like for a pen test scanning your local network but doing it internet wide. So quickly before we start, um, so my name's Mark, uh, you can find me on Twitter and so on and I do uh, security research at Rapid7 Labs. Now Labs is a small team, actually we're uh, three people right now and um, yeah, uh, it's, it's headed by HD Moore, uh, the founder of Metasploit and we're doing uh, lots of different research topics and free tools for our website you know, and other uh, amongst other things. Um, some other aspects you might maybe know me from or, or maybe uh, you heard of this. Um, I'm also a member of the HoneyNet project which is doing lots of research uh, in term, you know, in, towards malware and botnets and trying to educate people on, in, in those uh, subjects. Um, maybe some of you have used Cuckoo Sandbox before or maybe you have even been last year at the Black Hat US at our workshop um, which is an open source malware analysis uh, tool and framework and that's also um, what I'm involved in. So if, if anyone is interested in those topics which are unrelated to the talk here, um, yeah, hit me up afterwards and we can, we can have some awesome discussions about that stuff as well. Um, in the past I've been like researching a little bit into botnets and malware and trying to like figure out how the bigger botnet families work, the peer-to-peer -peer botnets, maybe you know, do something against it. Um, how can we maybe essentially fix something uh, you know, of, of this um, in for, to prevent this whole malware flood that we typically look at. Um, some of the side projects uh, doesn't matter too much, but yeah, if you're interested in any of that, make sure to, to hit me up. So I'm going to take you a little bit on a, on a small tour of what the history of, of this internet scanning uh, looks like and what people have done in the past. I mean, we're not the only ones, of course, doing this. Nowadays, there are lots of people doing this kind of stuff. Um, but I think we have a, a little bit of a unique approach. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think it's important um, to cover some of the basics and some of the messages that I want to, I want to put out today. Um, I will introduce you to the project that we're doing. Um, a little bit go into the challenges uh, that you can face with this kind of work. Um, and hopefully we can come to some awesome conclusions. And afterwards, every one of you will join me for beers later on or something and, and ask, you know, and, and we can work on the next project together. All right, so we're talking about large-scale scanning, internet-wide uh, research, internet-wide data gathering. So hitting every uh, IP address out there, hitting the completely, you know, every public IP address and uh, getting some data out of it. Now, um, just a, a little bit history about that. So people have done this um, very early. Uh, actually, um, I think one of the first projects, um, 98 at Bell Labs, uh, they started this internet mapping project. They essentially did uh, ping. ICMP echo requests to all IPs on the internet and just did this continuously like uh, I don't know even like probably every month or so maybe uh, maybe more often to just see how the usage of uh, IPv4 addresses continues over time and how it grows. Now that's of course very limited in scope and there are other projects um, the IPv4 census did a similar thing uh, ICMP echoes uh, uh, again. Then one of the maybe first like actual data collection projects internet wide um, maybe not one of the first. I mean, this is a non-extensive list. I mean, there were probably some that I miss. Uh, don't be mad at me. These are, I think, the, the major ones that I, I, you know, that present some milestones in this kind of stuff. So the EFF uh, SSL Observatory um, tried to go out and grab every certificate out there on the HD, HTTPS, um, so secure web um, servers, and look into how this looks like. Like, what is the landscape? What typically, what CAs do we see sign those certificates? What do people use in key sizes? You know, what, what, what does it look like? Like, what, what things can we find? Can we find some issues? And they published information about, 
you know, several different flaws that were kind of scary or kind of interesting at the time. I mean, there are hundreds of uh, certificate authorities in our browsers nowadays that never, you know, signed a single certificate that we saw on the public internet. So there was already a discussion like, what are those CAs doing? Like, what are they there for? And why do we have to have them in our browsers? Um, there were, of course, like two weak key sizes, weak keys in general, um, you know, the Debian bug, probably you remember uh, where you had weak generators. Lots of certificates are still out there on the internet used for web servers which have weak keys that you can easily factor. Uh, there have been embedded devices that have weak keys. I mean, there's lots of different things um, that came out of this project. And it, it was, at the time, I think it was regarded by most researchers as hugely valuable because it provides insight into something for the community um, where, you, where we just need to be aware that there are issues out there, mis misconfigurations out there that we need to address and be careful about when we deploy new systems at least because we probably won't be able to fix the old systems. All right, so continuing, one of the more recent, in 2012, um, more recent, I think actually the time is wrong. Oh, the ESS, sorry, the EFF Observatory was in 2010 and not in 14. Sorry, the slide is wrong here. Um, so in, in 2012, an interesting thing happened. So typically, like classically, people deem this internet-wide data gathering as somewhat infeasible because it's a high cost, you know, if you want to do, especially if you want to do a large amount of data collection, so you want to do maybe more than SSL certificates, you want to hit more ports, uh, grab more data, and so on. They deemed it to be unfeasible because too high cost for an individual project, you know, maybe some huge corporation can do it, but none, you know, none, none of the individual researchers could do this stuff. So some anonymous individuals, um, you know, one or, or, or several, they conducted uh, an internet-wide kind of study. Um, they scanned a lot of ports and they collected lots and lots of data um, by using essentially a botnet um, of infected, mostly embedded devices. So they, I think the number was around 400,000 devices that they managed to log into with some kind of default password or uh, guest password. So they essentially did like a dictionary attack, a very, t a very limited one. And they managed to uh, infect and take over 400,000 devices across the internet. And they used those um, in a very, let's say, careful, uh, almost academic approach to uh, conduct this internet census of the, of the internet. And they made sure that the devices weren't overloaded and they were really careful. But of course, this is like highly illegal, right? I mean, this is not something that anyone should do or, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a very controversial topic because in the end, they published all the results, the whole data set, uncompressed nine terabytes of data. They published that as a torrent and everybody could download it. And lots of people did and there was, there's a crazy amount like, of, of research projects and findings out of this, and it pr has proven to be somewhat valuable to the, to the community and to the security industry. And still, it's, of course, the, like, the collection is illegal in the way that they conducted it. Now, a lot of you also know Shodan, probably. And Shodan does internet scanning for quite a while now, and they index, actually, uh, the, the data that they get. So you can search it. You can just search for a certain device, and you will find like, all the devices that are out there. Now, this is... is very good as well because it's continuously done. So they, uh, those guys, they do it. I don't know actually what the what the uh, kind of interval is, but they do this continuously and they make it public. I mean, to a certain extent, like if you want to do a lot of queries, you need to be a customer or something. But essentially, you can you can go to the website and use it. So. Um, yeah, we've seen, we've seen several uses and probably a lot of you have used Shodan in the past like for your uh, jobs or for some research. Um, there, are different, there are different kind of projects that are not necessarily gathering data but uh, they are used for measurements. There's the RIPE Atlas which has over 6,000 nodes spread around the world which people just host. So essentially RIPE goes out, gives these small devices to people and they just plug it in at home and then it's used for uh, distributed measuring of, of you know, round trip times and so on. So critical I.O., uh, which is essentially where now the interesting stuff starts um, for me because this was done by my boss, so H.D. Moore. And um, he did this in 2012 and 2013 more, of a, more as a proof of concept. So essentially he wanted to do something uh, similar to what the Internet Census guys did, those, those botnet using guys. He wanted to do a project on the, with a legal, you know, legal collection method. So he, he got a bunch of servers himself. He paid for it. And he uh, did internet-wide scanning on several different protocols, and he did it using Nmap. So um, he just wanted to see, like, what is the cost involved? How fast can you do this? Um, what stuff do you find? And 
just do it, right? And, and send the data that's important, send it out to researchers. So he actually distributed it, anyone who asked, you know, you could just get the data and then make, do some research on it, maybe you'll find some stuff. Now, this was really a great outcome, like both for him and also, also indirectly for Rapid7, because we, out of this data set, we found so many interesting things and we uh, did some yeah, publications on top of that. So there was a UPnP white paper, which probably a lot of you have heard of. Um, last year, I believe, uh, beginning of 2013, um, came out where we discussed widespread vulnerabilities. Actually, I'm covering this in the next slide. Uh, and several other ones, which I'm going to cover. So, yeah. A quick excursion in the most po into the most popular service on the internet. So, who would assume probably similar to what we thought, um, that this is HTTP, so web service, or web servers, you know, websites. Um, probably a lot of, lot of people would think that is the most popular thing. Now, it turns out that the most widespread protocol and service you find on the internet is actually UPnP, uh, which is, yeah, universal plug and play. Um, so it's a set of network protocols that are used by devices to discover each other and configure each other in a certain sense. So you would find printers or other devices automatically on your home networks. It's mostly used by consumer devices, but it can also found, be found in like servers or uh, switches and so on. Now, as we found so many devices, um, he, so HD and a bunch of others, they started investigating those devices. And when you look at different types of devices and what kind of software stacks they use, it turns out that pretty much the majority of those um, UPnP server or implementations, protocols, so to speak, are done or, or uh, they, they are gotten from three different major software stacks. So all of those devices, doesn't matter whether it's Linksys or this router or Netgear or whatever, they license um, one of three major software stacks. And those are Broadcom, Mini UPnP, and Intel, uh, the Intel Portable SDK. So, um, and yeah, I mean, what can you expect? I mean, you, you take this protocol, uh, not, of, not a lot of people probably looked at this, and you find in every single one of them, you find remotely exploitable bugs, remotely exploitable vulnerabilities. So, um, this means essentially out of millions and millions, like 20 million or so devices on the internet that have this open, probably more even, I think there were, I don't know, I don't know how many, there were probably 100 million or so devices across the internet. You can just exploit millions of devices using Metasploit, um, you know, using an open, open public published exploit. So this, is, this was really a, kind of a major flaw that people found and, and it's still widespread. I mean, it's still out there, right? It's still um, on the internet. So... This was really, for us, the, the time where we thought, okay, this is, this is really important. Like, we, we found this protocol, we looked at it, apparently a lot of people didn't look at it before, and we find lots and lots of vulnerabilities, most of them pretty easy to discover, so it's very critical because these devices are internet connected and you could, like, immediately take them over, right? So we needed to raise awareness, so we published a white paper, we you know, hit some news sites, um, tried to spread the word, and lots of people knew now, okay, there's something weird going on with my router. And either some ISPs tried to make the situation better and they exchanged devices, of course, that's very costly. Some people, they updated their firmware and so on. So we tried to, I mean, you know, people try to make the situation better. So um, yeah, hopefully this reduces the attack surface. Now, now it gets interesting because at that time, we thought, okay, what else? What else can we find? Like, what kind of weird devices or misconfigurations or problems can we find on the internet if we look at this kind of data set, an internet-wide data set? Which brings me to this picture. So this picture um, was selected by a colleague of mine, by Claudio, and I think it really accurately represents the uh, landscape of devices and things that you find out there because the internet is a is a weird place, right? You find so many weird things, both in videos and memes and pictures, as you find in devices and configurations. So, um, yeah, I mean, of course, you can look at web servers, which is probably boring uh, compared to the picture. I mean, the picture, you know, speaks of weird configurations. HTTP web servers, not really weird. So, but I mean, out of internet-wide studies, you can you can get some interesting data out of this as well, right? This is this is somewhat boring, but I'm just going to cover it. So if you look at, for example, um, like the distribution of web servers across the internet, you find that a lot of, or actually most of, IISs and Apaches and so on, they don't run the latest version. Um, somewhat expected, I guess, but um, still, if you think about it, probably uh, most of them don't run the latest version, but then again, also, a lot of them will have not the latest security patches. So, I mean, you can, you can just look 
at the internet and see what typically people do with their web servers. Do they care about security updates? Don't they care? And, and so on. So, I mean, this is just... This is just what you typically look at when you look into those data sets, right? You can, you can aggregate, do counts of different versions, and so on. Now, it becomes more interesting when you look at other protocol types. And uh, I think SNMP is probably something you guys have uh, used before or, or, or you know, heard of before. So the simple network management protocol, it's used in uh, home routers, but also printers, modem switches, and a lot of enterprise uh, devices like appliances and so on. And it's used for both getting information about the device and discovering it, but also for managing it in, in most cases. So you can see like the routes and addresses and listening ports on the device, maybe some uh, you know, running processes. It always depends on the actual device and the actual software stack used, but it goes as far as that you can see patches that are applied to the device. You can see accounts and group names and so on. And the problem, like the problem with this is, oh, sorry, uh, I, I thought I had another slide here. So the problem with this is SNMP, um, they have, by default, they have configurations where you have, in most cases, a public read-only kind of um, login or how do you call it, like a credential. And then there's a read-write, a private credential. And in a lot of cases, either the pub, so there are devices that both with the so-called public credential allow you to write or configure the device. And also there are private ones which just have, you know, the standard default setting. And you, so it's, it's essentially like a default password. So what can you find on this? If you look at actually some devices and you do just a list processes, um, you know, you list the processes on this SNMP service, and you can find actually the arguments that are given to processes running on that you know, particular device, which leads you then immediately without any exploitation, any you know, hacking or whatsoever, it just leads you directly to credentials. So sometimes you will find you know, usernames, passwords, you will find URLs, um, IDs. I mean, it, it just is... There is a plethora, how do you call it, a uh, 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 so great variety of these devices out there. Um, you don't even know where to start looking in, into it, and you don't even know, okay, maybe, maybe here, the password master key 2011, maybe now I can use this to authenticate the device. But maybe it's also just, uh, I don't know, some internal configuration string, and it's not remotely accessible, so it's not a security vulnerability, right? I mean, so the, the point is, you see this, you typically think, oh my God, there's something weird going on, but in each individual case, you would have to look at the device, the software, and so on to, to determine whether it's actually a problem. Now, this continues as, a, as we go through the slides because this is like the story behind everything here. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the authentic authentication, the earlier uh, SNMP versions, which are, I think, very widely deployed still, um, are based on this community string. So you have the public read-only and private read-write string on a lot of devices. Now, these can be reconfigured, and it's actually uh, recommended to reconfigure those, but just, I mean as it is with routers, uh, not many people change the default settings, right? So um, some people, uh, some devices actually allow write um, access with the public identification. So what about reconfiguring functionality across 11 million devices across the internet? Just reconfigure routes or reconfigure the passwords or whatever, right? And thousands of routers through this can be instantly compromised. I mean, it's similar to UPnP. It's just, it's just everything out there, um, like, Within everything out there, there are thousands and thousands of devices which are immediately vulnerable to something. So it's not even, like it's not, sometimes it's not even about really hacking or, or, or like, I don't know, analyzing a device. It's in most cases just logging in or just connecting to it actually. All right, um, one, one more like small comment. I need to be a little bit quick. I actually have too many slides and too, many, too much content, but essentially um, you've probably recently seen there was a, a NTP denial of service um, attack which used NTP for traffic amplification now this is actually also really bad in SNMP there are some um, commands and some par particular like query types which you can use for immense traffic amplification in SNMP and I think you know once we now get our NTP servers fixed maybe the next thing that the, the bad guys use is SNMP and I will come back to this later because this is, this is really important to think about like right now before it's too late and before they do it. Um, okay, NetBIOS, other protocols, just to, just to go through this, like if, you know, looking at those major protocols, we can probably skip this because every one of you remembers the glory days of Windows remote vulnerabilities and, you know, SMB and CIFS and whatever, like the, uh, you know, the Windows uh, server stack and what is it called, uh, DCE, RPC, and so on. I mean, there were so many different vulnerabilities in that stuff. Um, let's, let's not, like, re revisit those. So interesting to me is, um, 
if you look at the next services, Telnet, FTP, SSH, of course, I mean, SSH um, is a somewhat considered to be secure service. Um, so maybe that's not the, not the one where we find most weirdness. So looking at Telnet, I think, is by far the most or weird thing that we found when you look at the internet. Because um, if you Telnet into a lot of routers, they don't even bother with trying to authenticate you. I mean, it's not even you're presented with a login and password. You're just presented with a shell. So you just, you tell that IP address on the internet and you're logged in and you can do something on the device. Now maybe sometimes you don't have root, maybe you don't, maybe you have. And this, this goes across the board. Like if you look just, I mean this is really, believe me, this is just scanning the internet, looking at what people, like what the telnet prompt gives you. I mean just what it looks like. We didn't send any login or anything. So you find Windows CE devices that just present you a CMD shell. So this is just, just connecting, right? Um, yeah, Linux shells. So these, you, you've seen the numbers in the top of the slide. This is like in the thousands again, right? So thousands and thousands of devices have shells just open. It's not even authentication. So uh, a lot of them drop to root. I mean, again, as I mentioned, you, some of you might think, okay, maybe, you know, maybe this is a honeypot system or something. Yes, true, probably some of them are. Like some of them are probably not a security flaw. But I, I would argue most of them will be a security problem. And it's up to every one of us to collectively decide what is a problem here and what is not. I mean, some of the things on the next slides, you know, might not be that severe, but ultimately it comes down to the picture. I mean, if you think about the weirdness and variety of things out there, there will be equally as, as many misconfigurations as vulnerabilities and, uh, you know, we just have to look at this and maybe fix it before it's too late and before people exploit that stuff. Um, you will find license plate readers, um, for example, in the US where you have a camera on the side of the road and it looks at license plates and parses them or recognizes them through image processing. And you connect to a telnet device on the internet and it streams you cars that are driving by. Now, I mean, maybe, maybe this is not a concern. Maybe it's, I mean, someone else who stands next to the road also sees every car driving by, right? So, but this is on the internet. So maybe, you know, maybe some people consider this bad. I don't know. Um, goes further, GPS tracking, uh, probably some of you have been in the, in the talk earlier today um, about the AIS uh, ship tra uh, um, tracking by Marco, he's somewhere here, yeah. Um, so, I mean, with the AIS stuff, for example, some people might argue, well, okay, it's publicly broadcasted, so it's not so bad that it's out there, and, you know, tracking ships, it should be done. Um, but again, maybe someone who targets a specific ship or who targets a specific uh, like company or, uh, or corporation, maybe for them it's useful that it's public. And in the same way, I mean, if you can follow a certain lorry driver around who, how he travels through Turkey uh, because he has some kind of device connected to the internet with a 3G or whatever SIM card, maybe it's not such a good idea. I don't know. I mean, maybe someone else wants to hijack the, 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 the traffic or whatever. Um, okay, so this is, this is like... A, a very kind of condensed look into, and, and this is a selection of what is out there, right? So um, this port, this connector here, uh, a lot of you will recognize it, it's the serial port. And the serial port is an interesting case because um, serial ports are still uh, very widespread uh, to manage devices on a kind of a physical level. So these will be present on routers, switches, you know, some enterprise devices, embedded devices. And typically, you associate this with some form of authentication already. I mean, some of those devices where you, where you have this port, you connect to it through, through a cable, and sometimes you need to authenticate. I mean, maybe, you know, they have some security feature there, but in a lot of cases you don't, because they assume, okay, you are in the server room already, so you have access to the device, so, you know, at this point, maybe you are like the admin anyway. So the problem is someone, or two companies mainly, um, decided that it's a good idea to bring those uh, physical kind of access um, port, the serial port, to the network. Because, I mean, administrators are lazy. Some of them, sorry, no, no offense. Um, some administrators might be lazy and might want to sit in their chair while administering a certain switch or a certain server. And so they want to, you know, do this from their maybe home office. So they get these devices, they connect them to the switch, and uh, on the other end it either has Wi-Fi or 3G. So you would have, you know, a 3G SIM card in there and you can manage your um, thing from home. So 
Well, to me, this doesn't sound like a good idea, but the companies behind this, they actually, I mean, they, they thought about this a little bit, right? So this, um, these devices, they allow you to interact with these ports, with the serial ports through Telnet, SSH, um, sometimes even a web server is on there with a web kind of web console. Um, you know, there are different modes to connect, like proprietary or direct, like a TCP kind of proxy mode. Um, and they actually have interesting functionality sometimes where they offer some automated interaction. So you can say, if you see this on the serial port, then do this. And this is actually used um, as kind of a expect style uh, programming thing where you instruct this server to interact with the device. And I think, so if you look at the public information about these devices, you can find like a use case of oil and gas monitoring. So you have this device somewhere and when a certain temperature grows too high, then it sends a command to lower the temperature or something. Like, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if this makes sense, but this is apparently what it's, what it's used for in some cases. Brewery tank monitoring, um, even medical device monitoring. I mean, there are these different pictures that you can find um, where, they, where they talk about use cases for these devices. But the, the point is, if you look now at the internet again, and we, we looked at uh, SNMP public system descriptions, so there's like a system descriptor description uh, field, and it seems that there are, or at the time, there were over 100K Digi and Lantronics devices um, that have SNMP running, and those devices are those serial servers, right? So we identified those devices, and uh, I think, yeah, so over 95,000 at the time were connected via some kind of mobile connectivity, so some kind of SIM card in, in, inserted. Um, now, the authentication methods that those devices provide are authenticated, encrypted TCP, authenticated, encrypted SSH, so there are a plethora of different communication methods, and... Um, yeah, I mean, it can be authenticated, it can be unauthenticated. So in theory, you would argue, okay, those di devices are secure, everybody can use them, right? But as is the problem, there are default configurations, there are, like, human factors, and what do you guess, what is the most common one across the internet? So these, these two, of course, so the unauthenticated TCP pass-through and unauthenticated uh, multiplex, those are the most common modes to interact with those devices. Now that means that if you connect to it, you have essentially a direct line to the serial port of this device, right? And that might not be, maybe, maybe sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. So, you find, for example, traffic signal monitoring devices. Now, those um, give you an information of what the traffic light, you know, if it's yellow or red or whatever, you, so you can monitor those. And in, in a lot of cases, these used actually uh, digi development kits, and um, they have like, they expose a certain protocol and there is a, a default password to this. So it's DBPS in this case. But you will find, for example, if you look into the internet census data or you look into uh, the, uh, SM, you know, the critical IO data, there are 40 or so in that data set and uh, a different amount in other data sets. Now, the point is, you connect to this device, you're connected to the serial port of it, and now the question is, is this a problem or not? Like, can I see maybe the traffic light? Can I maybe change it to, you know, have a different state? I mean, it always, from device to device, it depends. And this is, again, this is not something where I say this is vulnerable or this is like the next big thing and people will, you know, change all traffic lights. But I'm saying this is out there and people connected to the internet and, you know, we just need to, for all of these devices, probably think about what this means and if it's a bad thing. So if we look at other devices, there are fuel control systems. So tr fuel pumps where you charge, where you, you know, load up fuel fuel up your car, um, they are connected to, you know, 3G via this serial port server. And you will, you know, you connect to a Telnet port and you're essentially given this menu and it tells you like system setup, transactions, reports. And the question is now, what happens if I go into system settings? Will it give me a login or do I need to authenticate in some form? Or is it directly configurable? Can I maybe drive up to it, log in? to it, say, yeah, now, you know, activate fuel pump or whatever and just fill up for free, maybe. I don't know. Um, there are different, I mean, I, I just visit a couple of these to give you a feeling uh, that the cat picture is accurate. So, okay, so IPTV head-end systems, these are systems that connect like lots of IP cameras together, I think, and the problem with those is they actually have a uh, like on the serial port, it's similar to like a singleton inter uh, login. So essentially, 
when you log in, you're logged in and there are no multiple sessions or anything. There's one session on the serial port. So the problem is it has authentication. So it would be safe. You connect this to the internet, it's safe, right? Because it's only accessible when you're logged in. The problem is if you just disconnect from the session, the serial port won't notice it because the serial port is connected to this port server and that is connected to 3G. Now, if the 3G connection breaks, then it's still logged in and someone else connects to it. He doesn't need to authenticate again. It's still logged in. So this is sometimes the, the kind of disconnect between different technologies where you think, okay, the admin thinks, well, there's a user login you know, here, so I don't need to protect it in the serial port server, so I just switch the serial port server to being unauthenticated. Now that's fine as long as he doesn't disconnect mid-session, right? And if he remembers to log out every time. So sometimes this kind of disconnect can bring us new vulnerabilities if we combine these you know, technologies. Um, yeah, national dry cleaners in the US somewhere. Um, you can see someone had to uh, yeah, get some leather cleaned. I don't know. I mean, maybe you, can, maybe you can find the customer information in that system as well. But this is essentially just presented to you on the internet through a telnet protocol, right? Which is, again, in, in a lot of cases, I would argue it's not so, not so clever and that should, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be happening. All right, so we can't take this anymore. This is really uh, crazy. So let's get to a little bit more um, like the recent changes in internet scanning and why uh, we're now doing a project and why it's uh, actually very, very uh, different to the kind of historic approaches to internet scanning. So recently, there was research out of the University of Michigan and they both did some research, but they also published a tool and that tool is called ZMAP and, or ZMAP. Probably a lot of you have, have heard of this. Um, and um, yeah, it made some news because it's very, very fast and allows you to scan the internet very fast. And uh, yeah, they published a paper. So this is a purpose-built internet scanning tool, okay? It's only basically done for internet-wide studies. So it's not done for scanning your local network. Actually, there is no option to give it a subnet to scan. You can just exclude subnets. So, you know, if you do ZMAP minus P80, it will do an internet-wide scan of port 80. So there's no, like, you know, scan this network. This is just not planned in this software. So, yeah, so it, uh, if it saturates your gigabit Ethernet link, um, it will take 45 minutes to visit every IP in IPv4, which I think with, you know, that's, that means one connection, one system, one computer, right? It's only one, one thing. Like, it's your laptop connected to a gigabit port somewhere. So I think this, this really is a drastic reduction of what we had before. Um, HD, when he did the critical I.O., I think his scanning times were still around, I mean, days or a week or so for one particular port. Um, and yet that used, um, you know, a dozen machines or so. Um, so, and, and, and the EFF SSL Observatory, actually, it took three months, or they ran it in three months, and they collected uh, all those certificates within three months. So this is really a, a magni order of magnitude lower, right? And with this... This is really important because it has, it's not only a cost um, change, but it's also an accuracy change. Now, they did similar research to the EFF SSL Observatory. So they found um, there are factorable uh, RSA keys. So it's, it seems like there are a lot of embedded devices, modems and routers, which have a weak key generation or, well, let's say, weak random number generator. So it turns out that if you connect all those devices you know, across Germany or something, it turns out that a lot of them will share uh, some prime numbers in their keys. So they are factorable. And uh, if you do this continuously, so you scan for this um, lots, of, lots of times and you collect those certificates over you know, several weeks or months, you see a 20% decrease from 2013, or, well, from 2011 compared to 2013 uh, June. Now, that is something that is really important here, and I hope, I hope you understand what this means. This means essentially even if there are published vulnerabilities, published weak key uh, generation on routers, published uh, Debian weak keys, you know, the Debian key generator problem. Um, this is published research, and pretty much everyone in security knows about it, and still the improvement over years, like two years or so, is in the 20, 30 percent, depending on maybe on other th things, it's, it's less than that, right? So even for UPnP, I think the improvement rates are in the like 10 to 20 percent kind of order. So it's really even though it hits the media, you know, end users read about this on their newspaper or something, UPnP, all your routers are vulnerable. The actual improvement in terms of security and, you know, patching and firmware upgrades that are happening is really, really low. I mean, we're not really, even though it reaches pretty much everyone, we're not really doing a good job. I mean, you know, even though 
everyone knows about it. It's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll upgrade that next week, and then you know they forget about it probably. I don't know. I don't know what the actual reasoning behind it is, and it's something that we together probably need to figure out. All right. So yeah. So this leads to interesting times, right? Because um, be because of those guys, and the, actually, this is not the only tool uh, for the sake of completeness. Uh, there are other tools like Mass Scan who can actually be even faster. But um, the the point is that. This, is, this means now that we can do far more uh, cost-effective you know, um, and, and like low-budget internet scanning, and we can do it continuously and you know, every day and so on compared to having you know, huge costs and weeks of runtimes. And um, it's also far more accurate. So um, I think maybe I have this, I have this here. Uh, uh, no. So the, the, the point is it's now... It's now possible to do not only a project for three months and stop it, we can now continuously do this, right? And forever, like starting from now, we can scan like for SSL certificates and give you real-time updates of when your company's domain name is used in a certificate across the world somewhere where it shouldn't belong, right? I mean, this is now possible to do on a kind of a day-to-day -day basis. So this is, really, this is really one of the main reasons why we also wanted to invest some uh, resources into, into this kind of research and this kind of data gathering. So a big problem on this uh, is the traditional view on what scanning means. And I recently had a nice discussion with this, uh, with some, uh, on this with some CERT uh, uh, yeah, workers. So people that work in uh, incident response across the world, in government, you know, private sector, it doesn't matter. They see internet scanning as this next scary thing because everybody will now scan the internet and they will find all my devices and they will find all my vulnerabilities. But I mean, the point is, now that it's maybe more feasible for a lot more people to do, doesn't that mean that it's now time for you to finally like get, fix your devices or maybe disconnect them from the internet compared to as compared to we need to stop people from internet scanning, right? So an, anyway, um, I will come to, back to that later, but the point is lots of people will see this as an attack and traditionally, um, if they monitor their infrastructure and they see someone scanning them, they will send, for example, an abuse report to the source network of this, right? So, um, yeah, this is like a discussion of is the is the is um, the internet like if I share a document somewhere and it's publicly accessible, uh, is this now? I mean, is this now public information or is this a bad thing if someone accesses it? Can I sue him because he accessed my pub, my, my public document which I don't think he should download? Like, it's, it gets into all kinds of discussions which I'm which I'm happy to uh, engage with you about and I want to like you know start some thoughts on this. So this is typically what you get. So you get like, uh, please investigate the incident described in the for following partial log or, um, I don't know, this email is from Utah State University, you know, suspicious and malicious activity that appears to be sourced from your network. So this is kind of the stuff that you get when you do internet-wide scanning. You will run in all sorts of um, monitoring devices, dark nets, and so on, and they will send mails to your provider or your, you know, abuse uh, I uh, email address. And uh, they say, yeah, we blocked your IP address or we blocked your whole network range. And typically, of course, this is because this is considered to be a previous stage to an attack or to a maybe, you know, they want to do a port scan and then infect some devices or exploit some devices. But in this case, it's meant for, for different purposes, right? I mean, it's, it's meant for different things. And I'm, I'm getting back to that later. But this is typically what you get and you have to deal with it because we want to play nice with people and we want to, you know, explain pe uh, to people what we're doing. So yeah, so now we're coming to this. So if, if we're doing internet scanning and we want, to ev we want this to be a sustainable thing, we want that everybody thinks about this as we need to know about what is out there. We need to know about our problems and we don't need to ignore them because the bad guys, they will do this stuff anyway. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. Like if we, if we say, okay, now internet scanning is banned. You know, nobody's allowed to do it. That's fine. Now I can't do it anymore, but the bad guys don't care, right? I mean, they will do it anyway. So the point is we want to um, use this for the good purposes. Now, if we do this, um, you need to either, if you, if you want to do internet scanning, you need to either have your own IP space and then deal with abuse reports, or you have, a good host, you have to have a good hoster. Because in most hosters where you rent a VPS or a dedicated server, uh, it will kick you out in most cases if you do internet scanning. Because they see this as not wanted behavior or you know, they don't understand what you're doing. So... Um, you really have to engage with the security folks of that particular company to say, hey, we're doing this project, are you fine with us doing this project, and what are kind of the thresholds and the, the you know, framework of this. So, um, yeah, 
one thing about speed. I just mentioned that uh, there's another tool called Mass Scan, which allows you to even you know, be faster than 45 minutes. So I think those guys, they demonstrated to scan entire IPv4 in three minutes, which is impressive from a technical point of view. I think this is quite awesome. But uh, on the other hand, if you are talking about sustainable, you know, continuous internet scanning, this is actually not something you want to do because you don't want to overload networks. You don't want to get people angry at you. You don't want to scare people. You want to be nice, right? I mean, we want to be nice. We want to do this now and we think it's super valuable. We got previously research out of this that is really valuable to us and also the community, I think. So we want to be as slow as possible for while still maintaining accuracy. So um, I think we're, you know, if you look at 45 minute scan, that means 1.4 million packets per second. So first of all, your routers and your like upstream needs to handle this, but also remote networks that you hit uh, get a certain portion of that packet rate, of course. And, you know, you, you just, I think my, my view on this and our view on this uh, together is we need to play nice and, you know, reduce the speed to something manageable. Actually, I think we're running in three hours or so. You know, which is taking about 200 megabit or so of, of bandwidth on our side. Yeah, and of course, the probes, uh, sorry, sorry about this. Uh, the probes following the scan, so the certificate collection, for example, that we do, um, this needs to be, of course, tested. Because if you end up, like, sending some random checks to random devices on the internet, maybe you crash something, so you need to be careful about what you do and really make sure that it, you know, d works as intended. Um, so I think... I think this is really important for anyone who does this. There are, this is not, I'm going, not going to cover this, but just mention it. The ZMAP guys, so University of Michigan, they actually published these best practices. Uh, URL is on the slides, you have the slides uh, anyway. So um, they have a list of things that you should do, like you know, be transparent, uh, coordinate closely with network administrators, uh, verify that you don't overwhelm the local or remote network, and so on and so on. So this is really like transparency and communicative, uh, to be communicative about what you do and what the purpose of the project is, is to my mind really important and those guys, we share the kind of the best practices with those guys. All right, so the mission from our side is we want to gain like insight into, into what is out there. So for a particular customer, for example, um, we would like to be able to give them, hey, this is what your, cust like, what your landscape looks from the outside. Like, this is, if you look at uh, internet scanning data, this is what people can find about, you know, below your domain or something. Um, we want to you know what kind of security um, is maybe associated with, uh, with a particular device, like, does it have some misconfiguration, what is, what is the state of something. And, um, yeah, maybe we also want to prioritize, hey, this is more, this is far more uh, problematic than this other thing. So, of course, uh, you guys know um, Rapid7 does, um, you know, kind of maintain or, or back the uh, Metasploit um, tool, Metasploit framework, and also the pro version. So, of course, we also want to extend that. I mean, we want to have more coverage of bad things in Metasploit so, so you guys can test your networks and so on. So we want to, for all those devices out there on the Internet, we want to have fingerprinting. We probably want to find out if there are vulnerabilities, and we want to, of course, imp improve products. I mean, that's, that's normal. So, yeah. The, the plan was internally, okay, so we start this project, we do this internet scanning continuously, we uh, do it you know, weekly or bi-weekly or something, and uh, we want to find new issues and also monitor existing issues and kind of how they improve, and we want to raise awareness about them, and also, of course, um, a very important thing is share our data and our findings with the community. So this was announced by HD um, last year at DerbyCon, and it's called Project Sonar. So essentially, as I mentioned, we want to see what is kind of the state of the internet. Um, we want to scan and gather data. We want to have some statistics and trends out of this and share it again. Um, and yeah, the last point here, it's really important. So we want to make this data available to the community, right? So every one of you shouldn't say now, well, okay, it's cool that you do this and your graphs are nice, but I want to do this particular research and you know, this, this is important to me. Then we want to, you to be able to do this. And uh, essentially, you probably would all agree that if everyone in the room starts internet scanning now, um, Maybe that's, I mean, that's duplicate work, right? So we want to share kind of the workload and we also don't want to invest too much money. So we want to keep like our side of things small. So we want to share the whole data. Um, yeah, because we, we won't find everything. So, uh, you know, two pair of eyes and so on. Um, so what, what we do um, so far is we scan um, 443 TCP, which is the HTTPS port, and we collect the SSL certificates from it. 
So we gather all the you know, server certificates, CA certificates that are offered from those web servers, and we do this on a weekly uh, basis. Then um, additionally, we do um, HTTP and we do an, uh, a GET request. You know? So we get the index page, so we get the HTML from the index page um, from every web server out there. We do this, I think, bi-weekly. Um, reverse DNS was an interesting experiment, so we thought, hey, um, it could be interesting to gather all reverse DNS records, so pointer uh, PTR records um, for every IP out there, and we also do this bi-weekly, which was a bit of a challenge because uh, that's 3.8 billion lookups you need to do, and of course, accuracy, so you want to do this probably in less than like 24 hours, so yeah, this was quite a challenge from an engineering point of view and also um, um, you know, DNS server point of view. Um, yeah, we're currently testing some other things, like we want to also, instead of doing only uh, IP HTTP requests, we also want to do uh, name requests. The problem is that generates a huge amount of data. Um, I think it's on the next slide. I um, oh no, okay, one, one more in between before we come to the data sizes. So, of course, this is more than just an internet scan in terms of a port scan, right? We need to have like a port scan, so that is done via ZMAP or mass scan, and then the stage two happens, so the actual uh, SSL certificate collection or the HTTP uh, download and so on. So we use a dedicated server for, the, um, for ZMAP and mass scan, so for the port scanning. I think mass scan is written only with two S, so the next mistake on the slide, sorry. Um, and we use cloud instances in some cloud provider for doing the second stage, right? So once we find open ports, we then give this to some, you know, a range of, of systems in some, some kind of cloud infrastructure, and then we get the certificates through that. And yeah, so we have a tool called internal called AutoSonar, and that manages this. So essentially, by now, there's uh, like a cron job somewhere running and says SSL scan, and then it does this automatically, right? It, it ramps up some instances in the cloud, uh, installs them, prepares them, starts to scan, you know, does all the stuff, collects the data, zips it up, and then uh, uploads it to a public website for you to download. Yeah, and so it, it needs to be like fast, everything, and so on. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, reverse DNS was, was quite the challenge. So, um, if you're looking at, you want to do like all, you want to hit all IPs within 24 hours, means that you need to do 44,000 lookups per second. Uh, and that is probably some kind of, like, how do you say, like a load on a DNS server. And it's also quite heavy to do this on a single server. So, we're using, yeah, we built this DNS blast.c. Um, which, means, which meant, so we built this, oh yeah, it works, it's super efficient, but then we break you know, the DNS infrastructure of the cloud provider we're using, and then, well not break, you know, but slow down and kind of impact. I mean, they see spikes in their graphs and systems are slow, so they call us and say, hey guys, uh, you need to stop. Um, yeah, and then we essentially, because of that, um, this also meant that we were essentially DDoSing big name servers of big ISPs, so if they have a name server that maintains all the records for you know a big slash eight or something, then they would see a lot of um, traffic from us. So yeah, the, the the end thing was we needed to apologize to a lot of people and uh, yeah and talk to them and define the thresholds, define the speeds that are acceptable. I mean, we we actually had a very positive communication with a lot of these folks, like the cloud infrastructure, but also the uh, providers. And they said, okay, hmm, this sounds interesting, the project, but you know, in the way that you did it, you can't do this. Like this is too much, right? So we defined together, we defined the thresholds, uh, and yeah, now it's running and it's all working, and I don't know, everybody's happy apparently. Um, Okay, so this is what I call uh, dealing with big enough data. So I'm not in the big data business, probably some of you are. Big data business means you have lots of servers and lots of like clusters of databases and whatever. I don't really have that, so I have like, I don't know, three servers somewhere in Germany or one server in the US, so it's really like limited. So the problem is, again, I gather a lot of data, but it's hard to well, make it searchable. I mean, I, I, I'm not a showdown, right, so I don't have this kind of background. So we're looking at um, weekly SSL certificates, so you're looking at 40 million open ports for 443 ac across the internet. Um, we get about 25 million SSL certs in total from those. Um, I think that's because 
Uh, a lot of them are duplicates. So, I mean, if you look at Google, for example, they will probably have thousands and thousands of servers with the same certificate. Then again, we probably, some of them are misconfigured or they're actually not running uh, SSL. So we see a lot of normal HTTP web servers on port 443 for whatever reason. So, yeah. So this generates around 55 to 60 gigabytes of data within around four hours. Now, um, the AT TCP, so HTTP GET, um, 70 million uh, open ports around 3.5 kilobytes uh, on average on data, but so that means um, this is like 20, 220 to 240, depends, uh, gigabytes within 10 hours that this generates, right? And then we somehow want to do something with it, and we also want to upload it and make it available to you guys. So it's, uh, you know, it's somewhat of a challenge if you're dealing with just a couple of servers that you have somewhere. Um, yeah, reverse DNS, the same thing. It's 1.1 billion records appro uh, approximately, and that means around 50 gigabytes plain text, you know, in, in, in record pairs, essentially. Um, so there, I, I mentioned this. So the name uh, HTTP GET, so if, let's say we have, you know, Facebook.com, Google.com, all those names, and we do HTTP GET on every one of those, that will be a lot more data than just the IP-based uh, vhost. So this generated, we tried this for around 200 million names, maybe 250, I can't remember for sure, but this generated 1.5 terabytes of data. Now, this is, again, a lot harder to share with you guys because we need to have the bandwidth and the storage and so on. And it's also for us, we can't do that bi-weekly, at least not with the budget that I currently have. Like, I can't, I can't sustain this. So the question is, like, how do you, how do, you do this? And this is running since uh, roughly November uh, 2013. So this is really a little bit my personal big enough data problem that I deal with um, because I'm not coming from any big data background, so I need to yeah, somehow deal with this stuff. Um, okay, so yeah, as I mentioned, so you have, um, if you have like millions of records, um, it tends to blow up some of the even like the high performance, low level key value stores and whatever you have you, if you get these tools from the internet and you say, yeah, it's an awesome, efficient database, and then you start to insert hundreds of millions of records, they will break in a lot of cases. I actually need to be fast, I'm already a little bit over time here. Um, so yeah, so this is like we want to build uh, databases out of this, but it's very hard to do um, with the kind of project that I'm dealing with. All right, so I'll skip this a little bit. Um, so we're building lookup tables, um, and this looks like it's very, it's not really very enterprise. I'm sorry for this, but you know, it typically looks like a big shell pipeline of tools that are catted into each other, and you know, it's all kind of uh, a little bit feels a little bit uh, dirty hacky, but I mean, this is the way that we deal with it and it's somewhat efficient, I think. It's somewhat, you know, high performance, uh, if you can talk about that with, with a single system. Um, yeah, we use something called LevelDB. We uh, have some storage in uh, PostgreSQL and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's different data stores that are each used for the specific purpose where they fit, you know, where the technology fits the purpose. So it's, it's a little bit of a kind of a hetero heterogeneous uh, environment. All right. Um, Oh yeah, um, yeah. So the problem is um, this. This was a problem where essentially you write this individual tools and you need to scale them up. You need to make them, you know, faster. You need to parallelize them. And I don't have the the time to actually write parallelized code. So we end up doing stuff like in the bottom there, where we use a GNU parallel, which is a tool I've never heard of before. But when I did this work, it was really valuable because it essentially uh, spawns like you know a lot of processes from the same like type and just splits up the input into different of those, and it's super helpful. Um, but it's all kind of, it's all individual command line stuff, and it's not really, you know, a Hadoop cluster that I'm dealing with, right? All right, so um, what we built is, out of the data that we get, we built some interesting lookup indexes, and I, I'll show you a quick demo in a minute here before we are uh, almost done. Um, so, for example, you can do searches for certain domain names and find, you know, all certificates that have something rapid7.com or something your domain name in them, right? And you build lookup tables for this for investigative purposes. And uh, I will show you a, yeah, I will show you a, a, a demo quickly. So I wanted to cover um, still some things that we can do with this. And I'm skipping through this now because I'm over time. I was slower than I expected. Um, but essentially, there are a lot of different angles to this, and I hope that you have some ideas as well. And our ideas were, we want to do this continuous SSL observatory, so we want to look up you know, what kind of changes in our SSL landscape, and we want to do this on a continuous, um, you know, free, uh, regular way. Um, we're, how, how do they improve, and so on. Uh, we want to prioritize vulnerability research, so we want to see if a device is popular, we probably want to look at it first compared to a device that is you know, only used for 10 devices across the internet. 
um, exposure of vulnerabilities. Um, so, for example, you, I'm not sure if you remember the CIRCOM backdoor recently. We found 7,000 routers across the internet that had this running. Uh, there was recently a new module in, in Metasploit for some Yokogawa SCADA equipment where we found vulnerabilities and two of them were uh, available on the internet as well, which is kind of scary, I think. Yeah, and you kind of, you just find a kind of a, gra grab, a grasp of what is, what is out there and what you're dealing with. Um, yeah, you can do stuff like continuous defacement statistics. We can do like a public scoreboard of the best defacers out there or something where you just look for the HTML and you see, you know, hacked by hacks or something, or hacked by the Syri uh, Syri Syrian electronic army or something. And you will just, you just, just need to look into the data and look for hacked by, and you can make statistics out of this. It's kind of fun. Um, find parser bugs, right? So internet data is stressful for a lot of parsers because they don't expect what is out there in, in weirdness. So we found a bug in Ruby. Um, it's parsing certificates in the wrong way. There's a bug upstream. Um, so you find all these different things, and this data is useful for, I think, so many different angles that I can't possibly cover all of them here. So what's next? So we want to extend uh, we, this, this project. We want to gather more certificates. We want to have more data in there. Um, and so we want to build reporting out of this. We want to get, generate all this, what I mentioned. We want to generate stats and statistics and graphs and so on and allow for easier collaboration. Now, um, oh, God, I need to be really fast here. I probably have, like, three minutes left. Um, I'll skip this here for now. So collaboration is highly important. So the scan data is published at scans.io, which is hosted by the University of Michigan. I think I have it on the next page. So I can probably show this to you, but it's, uh, essentially it's a website at the University of Michigan, and all the data sets are up there, and they are continuously uploaded. So the SSL certificates, if you look at this, every Monday, I think, you will find new data from us, right? And you can just download the raw data that we get from our, from our scans. And you can look into it yourself. You can find you know, devices out there. Uh, uh, Billy Reyes, he did a talk about the uh, you know, building management just earlier in another room. And you can find those devices in, a, in the data set, right? You can just use it. You don't need to scan the internet. You can just use this data set. And then you can play around. All right, so wrapping up, yeah, the internet is broken. Um, and we're not really improving the overall state, I think, of security. We're doing individual good jobs. You know, this, this thing, this bug is fixed, and this bug is uh, updated now, and now it's, uh, it's all good. But it's overall, there are just many more bugs and many more devices piling up, and we can't possibly cover them all, and people, you know, misconfigure them and so on. Um, yeah, moving forward, we want to uh, generate, like, more awareness and visibility and um, just take the or orange stuff for now because we need to move fast. Uh, collaboration is essential for this stuff because we want to collect this and analyze this and we can't do this on our own with the three guys that we have. Um, yeah, internet scanning helps. Um, let's skip, skip this. Oh yeah, check out other stuff. People did presentations on this before. Uh, Professor Halderman from the University of Michigan, he did a presentation that's online on, on YouTube, I think. HD Moore's keynote, Scanning Darkly, is online on YouTube. So you can find those um, as well. Uh, you have my slides on the CD, I think, so you can just check this out. Um, yeah, so the internet is broken. Uh, internet scanning saves lives. I hope you agree with me. And uh, sharing is caring, obviously, so we want to share our data and hopefully you share results with me. And please come to me afterwards because there are some, some things we can discuss about uh, even though we're out of time here. All right, so thanks. And uh, Yeah, we're probably, we, we don't have a lot of time. Maybe we can, one question, but probably it's over. Um, I'm happy to talk with you all night uh, and after the, the, pro after the uh, talk, but if you guys need to head out or get to the next uh, presentation, I don't know what, we have a break now maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so IPv6, obviously, uh, as most of you know, IPv6 you can't really easily enumerate as IPv4, but there are some ways that we could still do some scanning on IPv6. So, for example, you can, um, for all the domain names or for, for all, like, the, you know, names that we find in all the data sets, we can do uh, just lookups and look up if they have an IPv6 address and then scan the appropriate IPv6 address for services. So we could see, we could do something. I think we have currently a list of 40 million, 50 million IPv6 addresses that are associated with some kind of name so that we have DNS records for. So we could scan those, for example. And then there are different other uh, approaches. But yes, enumerating and scanning everything, of course, not feasible. But we will find probably a good subset of available devices in IPv6. Yeah. Um, I have some demos. If anyone wants to see a demo of the lookup tables and we can look at some data, uh, feel free to come to me afterwards. 
Anyone else? All right. Thank you. Oh, one more? Yeah. Well, so this is sending one packet to every IP, right? So it means, like, if you have a large network, like, you have a slash 16 of public IP addresses, which is probably considered a large network nowadays, um, we would essentially send 65,000 packets over the course of three hours to the, to the network. Now, I would argue that this is compared to the general noise you get on a network like this, is probably super small. Like this is, you know, a fraction of what you get in typical noise from all over the world. So I think, I don't, I personally, that's my personal opinion. There's no scientific background or data to this, but I think that the amount of traffic you see from, for example, a ZMAP scan with one probe for each IP is very low compared to the normal kind of stuff that arrives at you. So, of course, if people start, like more and more people start doing this, and you have, well, as I mentioned, the whole room starts scanning for port 80, then of course this, like, this trip, this, this, uh, yeah, gathers, piles up, and lots more people, lots more packets, lots more bandwidth. But honestly, like, if you look at stuff like torrents and whatever, I mean, if you look at other protocols, there's so much more data and bandwidth that is used every day. I think from a bandwidth and endpoint point of view, this is not such a big deal. Uh, it would become a big deal if everyone on the planet would do it, but not, you know, if even a thousand people would do this every day, you probably won't even notice. I think, you know, it's, it's very, I think it's very low impact in terms of bandwidth and packets per second and so on. It's, it's okay. I mean, of course, this is why we're sh sharing data, right? I mean, if you can grab our data, maybe you don't need to do it yourself. Depends. And if you want it more often, then maybe ask us to do it more often uh, rather than just doing it yourself. So it's, you know, this is why we want to share and this is why we want to collaborate. All right, guys. Um, for those of you who are still sitting, I can do a quick... Oh, we don't have a slide anymore. We don't have my device anymore. Can you, uh, can you switch on the screen again for just a minute? Can you switch on the screen again for just a minute? So... Um, I'll, I'll just do a quick look up against some Singapore and, um, you know, web server and see what we find in our data for anyone who wants still, uh, is still waiting for getting coffee. So, does this microphone work here? Yeah, it's working now. Huh? Oh, perfect. Oh, shit. All right, so let's move this over here. Um, move this bigger. So we can, for example, so I, I've heard that this is a public, um, you know, website that is somewhat popular in, in Singapore. So we could, uh, we could check the data um, and see what we find for hardware zone COMSG, right? So we would find, let's do it again. So we would find, for example, in the data, because this is, this is internet scanning data, it's active data, right? You could, but you can build databases out of it that you can look up stuff against. So we would find, okay, we find these, all these records um, that are pointing to several IP addresses below hardwarezone.com.sg. Uh, now this is all good and fine, so now you, we have like public facing devices from this particular vendor, right? But maybe it would be interesting to see what other webs or names do they also use for this particular website? How do they get you maybe also to the website? So we take one of the IPs, take maybe this one here, this one on the bottom, and now we do a lookup um, against that IP address and see what names point to it, right? So we see they also use gameaxis.com or uh, I don't know what else well, is there, hardwarezone.sg and you know different domain names. Now in this case, this is probably pretty boring, but for other for other applications, for maybe, you know, more malicious sites or shared hosters or something, you will find lots of weird domain names pointing to the same IP address. I think for Rapid7 it's also quite funny. Um, let's see. Rapid7.com. So if we take one of the IP addresses here, I think this one might be it. And we do the same thing. Uh, yeah, you find like lots of domain names that Rapid7 likes to uh, register. What is it? Unified Vulnerability Management .org or something. I never knew that we had these domain names, right? And sometimes it's just interesting what your kind of what your IP addresses that you have in your organization are also used for. What kind of names to point to them? Sometimes it's not even your own addresses. We've seen stuff where just people point their DNS records to our servers for whatever reason. It's not really useful, but they do it anyway. So I mean, there are some. They, there are. 
dozens of use cases for this kind of data set. I hope uh, if anyone wants to see more, uh, just come to me afterwards, but I'll free the stage now.